the Museum of Curiosity. Hello, my name's John Lloyd and I'm the Professor of Ignorance at the University of Buckingham. Welcome to the Museum of Curiosity. Joining me is the man who fans of this year's hunky curator calendar know as Mr. October. It's Sean Locke. Thank you. Thank you. So what have you been up to this week, Sean? I understand you've had quite an interesting idea. Yeah, well, I went for a meeting at the BBC, which is uh, after the Jonathan Rus Russell Brand incident, I thought the BBC went in the wrong direction. I think they should have gone more offensive, uh, upset more people. Because I think what the BBC should do is actually make their complaints line a premium rate number. <laughs> yeah, it's a good idea, isn't it? We'd get rid of the licence for you altogether. We'd get, I can't believe <laughs> Hugh Edwards just said that. <laughs> well, while we dangle on tenterhooks waiting for that, let's meet the three knick-knackitarians who will be adding to the museum's stock of curiosities this week. World-renowned nephologist and nihilitarian, Gavin Preeter Pinney, the after award winning particle physicist Simon Singh, and a pig farmer from the West Indies, Tim Fitzhigham. <laughs> so, before we unwrap the goodies they've brought for us today, let's find out a little more about them, starting with you, Tim. Tim Fitzhigham is a comedian, author, adventurer, and quadruple record holder. He also holds the title of Most Puissant Knight of Santa Maria by a deposed Caribbean monarchy, Tim. Or perhaps I should call you Sire or yes. something. What should I call you? Tim will do. <laughs> Which country was it that made you a knight? Redonda. It's an amazing story, actually. It was an Irishman that went out to the Caribbean and had himself crowned the king of an island because, quite simply put, no one else wanted it. So yeah. And how many other puissant knights are there? Are there? There's three of us. Three. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's a small island. I mean, what can I tell you? <laughs> and, and uh, so you're also Freeman of the City of London. Does yeah, that involve absolutely. any special privileges, hats? For, well, kind of... It gives you the right to drive sheep across London Bridge, uh, thereby closing a major arterial route through London. <laughs> <laughs> and and the, the one that I really love doing is, um, is wearing a sword in the City of London. Uh, which is amazing, because not only the, can the police not arrest you for wearing a sword, when you draw your sword, the police have to follow you. <laughs> uh, it gives you the right to drive geese down Cheapside, which... Uh, and they haven't updated any of, the, any of the sort of privileges like you. I think it'd be nice if you were able to stop one of those not-in-service buses. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, 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 absolutely. That's great. So, Sean, do you have any qualifications? Uh, uh, well, not qualifications. I, I don't have any honours as such, but I was on holiday in Spain once, and I got very friendly with a bloke who rented out the pedlos. <laughs> and I, if, say, I was over the hour, I came back maybe an hour and 20 minutes later, <laughs> he just charged me for the hour. So, <laughs> I, feel, I felt like I had privileges. That, you know, <laughs> It's special to me. But no, nothing, nothing as illustrious as these. No, well, no, he's got lots more. Look, your pittance are of Selby and the Ridings. Uh, I have to give the priest of Selby Abbey uh, one pound a year to uh, look after himself. Commodore of Sudbury, what does that involve? It's the fourth highest rank in the Navy. First Sea Lord, second Sea Lord, uh, Princess Anne, me. And, uh, <laughs> and, 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 um, how did you get all these titles? And I, get, I, get, I get my own flag. And so, uh, how did you come to have a lavatory named after you? Ah, well, I rode the English Channel in yes. a bathtub, and um, it turns out to be the busiest shipping lane in the world. <laughs> so I phoned the Royal Navy, and uh, by mistake I got put through to a rear admiral at Admiralty Arch. And uh, now my uncle and great uncle and various people in the family were all sailors. And they said, if ever you're talking to uh, a member of the Navy, never start the conversation with the words, hello, cheeky. They said, <laughs> they said, always start the conversation with the question, how are your futtocks, old man? <laughs> I thought, well, I'll give it a go. So I said, ah, oh, Rear Admiral, how are your futtocks, old man? And he replied, at the furthest reach, dear boy, at the furthest reach. <laughs> Now, I asked my uncle about this, and he said, yes, Tim, that is the correct nautical response. And I said, well, that's fantastic, uncle, but what does it actually mean? He said, well, that's the thing, Tim, nobody actually knows. <laughs> I did make it across the channel. And when I got back, the uh, managing director of Thomas Crapham Company said, in honour of the Bath Channel crossing, we are going to release a commemorative lavatory. 
named after you. <laughs> the Fitzhigham. You could actually go and buy my, my family seat. <laughs> and actually, there's a little uh, picture of me in the porcelain to give men something to aim at. And does it have, how are your futtocks? Yes, yeah. it did. <laughs> Tim Fitzheim, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Our next guest, Gavin Preta Pinney, is a graphic designer and author who co founded The Idler, a magazine whose aim is to restore dignity to the art of doing absolutely nothing. So, Gavin, you were creative director of the Idler for 13 years, is that right? That's right. But you weren't a complete slug all that time, were you? Because the Idler's not really about doing nothing, is it? There is a philosophy to the whole magazine. As you say, it's not just about doing nothing. The philosophy is about how the best ideas, the most creative thoughts, come to you when you're not thinking. And so I think there's a kind of really important aspect of our week that we forget about, which is the time when we're doing nothing. And so, it, yes, it really is championing that. Do you have any interesting honours, like Tim? Are you familiar with the um, Amateur Astronomers Association of Kurdistan? <laughs> <laughs> I am actually an honorary member. <laughs> uh, that's Why wonderful to hear. Why haven't I seen you at any of the, the meetings? <laughs> Let's talk about clouds now, Gavin, because you founded the Cloud Appreciation Society. Was this a sort of... Uh, um, had you always liked clouds, or was it Yeah, I always, I've, I've always found them uh, intriguing. Uh, I gave a talk about clouds and um, decided to call it the inaugural lecture of the Cloud Appreciation <laughs> Society, just to, in a desperate attempt to try and get people to come along. You know, lots of people came, and they all said they'd love to join the society, and how would they do it? So I thought, well, actually, I should just start one. I think that someone needs to stand up for clouds... <laughs> because frankly, you know, they get a bad press, don't they? People talk about someone having a cloud hanging over him, cloud on the horizon. It's all negative. Um, and mm. yet... No, it's Cloud Nine. Cloud Nine is, yeah, one of the few, yeah. Um, named after the cumulonimbus storm cloud, um, that one. But we won't go into that now. But yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> there, there are few and far between the, the good ones. So you that, started you know. as a website, right? Yeah. Your book was rejected. 28 different publishers turned it down, didn't yeah. they? Yeah. And, and now it's huge. And then, mm. In fact, the guy who um, first agreed to publish it, he turned it down as well. There was something about the way he said no, which wasn't too sure. He wasn't absolutely sure about it in my mind. Can you replicate that? No? No. <laughs> How about that? How about that? It wasn't like... No. <laughs> but it's good to say no, but leave, uh, leave open the possibility that you might not have meant no. Yeah. No, it isn't. Because if you, if you say no, then you want to mean no, don't you? No. <laughs> Anyway, your, work, your next book seems to be about waves of all That's, things. Yes. Mm. So I'm in the middle of that at the moment. What kind of waves? Sea waves or...? Sea waves, sound waves, light waves, Mexican waves, brain waves, <laughs> anything. All waves. If it's a wave, then, it's, then there's room for it in my book. Well, I'm looking for your book, Gavin. Uh, let's give a little wave for Gavin Preta Pinney, everyone. Here we have a little <laughs> wave. Thank you. My final guest, Simon Singh, is a BAFTA award-winning documentary maker and author and journalist, but mostly is a specialist in science and maths. Simon, why did you stop being a professional physicist? Um, I, I mean, I, I loved physics. I, I just I didn't have that precision that's required. Mathematicians just are incredibly precise in everything they say and do. Uh, and I remember one of them telling me a story once about a mathematician and a physicist and an astronomer. Uh, but these three gentlemen are on a train going to Scotland and they cross the border and they see a field containing uh, a, a black sheep. And the astronomer looks at the other two and says, look, um, all sheep in Scotland must be black. Physicist, a bit more precise, looks at him and says, no, no, only some sheep in Scotland must be black. And the mathematician looks at the other two, shakes his head and says, no, gentlemen, all we can truly say is that there exists in Scotland at least one field containing at least one sheep, one side of which is black. So... <laughs> I could never live up to that level of, of accuracy. That's why I became a journalist, I suppose. That's a... Well, you say that, but there's a great story that um, Katie Mellower uh, had a song called Nine Million Bicycles in Beijing, and you took exception to the science in that, didn't you? Yeah, I'd just written this book about cosmology and how old the universe was and so on, and first verse is fine. There are nine million bicycles in Beijing. That's a fact. Next verse, however, goes, we are 12 billion light-years from the edge. 
Now, that implies that the universe is 12 billion years old, which it isn't. It's 13.7 billion years old. Um, <laughs> she, says, uh, she then goes on to call it a guess. Scientists don't make guesses. Um, she says, you know, but I know that I will always be with you. But I, at this point, I can't trust a word this woman says. So, <laughs> um, I wrote a little article for The Guardian about this. And, and at the end of the article, I rewrote the lyrics. And my version of the lyrics went, we are 13.7 billion light years from the edge of the observable universe. Um, that's a good estimate with well-defined error bars. <laughs> but with the available information, I predict that I will always be with you. Um, and, <laughs> and, and the shocking thing was that Katie Mello actually rang me up. <laughs> and she was a wonderful sport, and she recorded her song using my lyrics, which is the, <laughs> which is the high point of my career as a science journalist. It really mm. is. Um, so, uh, t uh, codes, that's another thing. You're, you've written a lot about codes. Don't you own an Enigma machine? Did I read that somewhere? Yes. I managed to obtain one which was used um, in France in the Second World War. The Enigma machine was, was the German form of encryption uh, which uh, protected all their communications in the Second World War. I don't know anything about encrypting codes. I've done a Sudoku. Is that... <laughs> In the paper, what I really like about those Sudokus is they grade them and they have, like, uh, easy, medium, fiendish. Whereas, really, underneath all of them, they should have pointless. <laughs> <laughs> I must say, I'm terrible at puzzles. I wrote a book called The Code Book, and in the back of it, there were ten coded messages for people to break. Mm. And it took a, a team of Swedish jugglers over a year to break it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, they, they rang me up, and, and there was a £10,000 prize. Did they like, win the prize? Yes, I gave them the £10,000. I said, you know, very well. And they said, look, Simon, what you don't realise is that in the final stage of your encryption, the one that was supposed to be really strong, you actually made a really uh, elementary error. You, you encrypted things in the wrong order, yeah. which effectively meant we could have broken it within a day if we'd known you'd made a mistake. And I said, well, fortunately, you didn't think I could be that stupid. And... Uh, <laughs> It was a really nice lesson because Enigma, for its time, was effectively unbreakable, but often it was the way that it was used that undermined its security. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Simon Singh. Thank you very much. <laughs> and so now it's time for our distinguished advisory panel to lift the veil on their museum submissions. Mr Curator. Yes, thank you, Professor. <laughs> the museum is now in the receive position. So, Gavin, you're first. What would you like to add to our collection? Well, I'd like to add a cloud. Um, <laughs> it's not just any old cumulus cloud. It's called the Kelvin Helmholtz cloud. It looks like a series of undulations, but they're not just gradual. These are ones that have risen to a peak and they curl right over, like in a spiral, so they look like a series of breaking waves. Um, for me, at least, they embody some of the best aspects of watching the clouds. They are ephemeral, transient, and you can watch the series of waves rising in a peak and breaking and curling over, and the whole process is done in about two minutes. So they're one of the most poetic parts of nature. They're always in transition, and they're always moving on. It's also because it reveals the currents of the atmosphere. And this cloud forms in a very specific situation when you have a layer of cold air with a layer of warmer air above, and they're moving at different speeds or different directions. And in between the two, you get this shearing effect, which is what causes these undulating waves to form. And they also therefore remind us that the atmosphere is an ocean, just like the ocean down below us, an ocean which contains waves in it. And then the fact that they're rare. To observe one, you have to be both aware of the sky, constantly looking up, and you also have to be very lucky. The only shame is the name, Kelvin Helmholtz, wave mm. cloud. I, I'm nervous to say anything. It was, wasn't that hypnotic? Didn't you feel you were sort of being lulled? I, I, I'd love to see this cloud. It sounds amazing. I think what you were saying earlier about clouds is quite interesting. In a way, it's one of the few things you know you've got in common with anyone you meet is basically is what's it like out on Earth today. Yeah, exactly. And the clouds are the same generally the world over. They, of course, pay no attention to political, cultural boundaries. So they are a great unifying force from that point. Really? No, they don't, really? apparently. I'm not that I... London, that's kind of a shock. <laughs> <laughs> so they're not British clouds, I'm <laughs> 
I'm looking at foreign clouds. <laughs> it says here that the biggest clouds in the tropics, cumulonimbus, can extend from 2,000 feet in the air to 60,000 feet. Yeah, Much the, taller than that. The taller clouds actually can be incredibly violent. I mean, I read that a cumulonimbus cloud can contain the power of 10 Hiroshima-sized Bombs. Have you heard of this bloke who fell from a, one end of a cumulonimbus to the bottom and it took him 40 minutes, apparently? Yeah, he was oh, a pilot, course, yeah. Lieutenant Colonel William Rankin, and yeah. his engine seized. He got stuck inside, being blown up and down inside the cloud. Like, oh, so yeah. that's why it took him 40 minutes to fall. He didn't fall a long way. He was just kept being blown up. From, that, from really? where he was falling, it should have taken him 10 minutes to reach the ground. Which was right? half an hour of just being in a cloud. Being big stuff, kind yeah. Of... That's yeah. brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> He wants to go. You Seriously, it happened Wait, again. Was there recently? any side effects to this guy? I mean... Yeah, he, um, he got pummeled by hailstones. Oh, yeah. His ears were bleeding from the thunder. Mm. And his body was covered in these strange red lines as a result of him expanding so much in the pressure that they were the stitching of his flying suit. I just saw this bloke bouncing around a cloud and look at his watch and going, Blimey! <laughs> 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 I should be out of this cloud by now. <laughs> this is ridiculous. 28 minutes! In fact, it happened again quite recently. There was actually a girl. She got sucked up into the cloud rather than falling down. She was... <laughs> what was she doing? <laughs> she, she was in a... Was it a big uh, dress? Yeah, she was in a <laughs> hangar. She was in there for a, a, an hour and a half, I think, oh, seem to remember. <laughs> She, did, she with blacked a hang out. Glider. She's going around with a hang glider. Yeah, but I think it was a paraglider actually. And she um, blacked out, but right. when she finally came to later on, she came out of the, near the top of the cloud and saw a moment of sunshine and then kind of got sucked back in. <laughs> <laughs> Another half an hour. Uh, <laughs> back in that bloody cloud. <laughs> Well, listen, thank you, Gavin. The museum gratefully accepts your Kelvin Helmholtz billows. Now, we've got to decide where to put them. Now, wait a minute. How about putting them in here, in this enormous room? Up there by the ceiling. <laughs> it's fine by me. <laughs> here we are, in the museum. Thank you. Simon, the museum is still in the received position. <laughs> what would you like to add to our collection? It's uh, the 400th anniversary of Galileo using the telescope for the first time. I thought, in light of that, it would be great to bring a telescope into the museum. But then the question is, which telescope to bring? And um, I thought I'd bring in a radio telescope. And the radio telescope in particular that I wanted to bring into the museum was perhaps the one that's made the greatest discovery ever. And it's the Horn Antenna in New Jersey. In 1965, a couple of radio astronomers called Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson thought, we'll use this radio telescope to look at some galaxies. But before they did that, they thought, we'll calibrate the radio telescope. Mm. So they pointed it at nothing, and they picked up microwaves, which are kind of a type of radio wave. And they were a bit frustrated by this, so they pointed it somewhere else. Wherever and whenever they pointed this radio telescope, they got more and more microwaves. And they thought there was something wrong with the wiring, so they clambered up inside and they spotted that there were two pigeons living there. Uh, and the pigeons had deposited what they diplomatically called a white dielectric material. So they, <laughs> they got a big pigeon trap and they caught the pigeons and they took the pigeons back to their offices about 10 miles away. They released the pigeons. Pigeons being pigeons just flew straight back. Um, so they shot the pigeons. Um, <laughs> But still, these microwaves kept on coming. And eventually, a couple of cosmologists got to hear about the, these annoying microwaves and said, look, you don't realize it, but the theories we have about the Big Bang, it should have released a blast of microwave radiation, which should still be in the universe today. And what you've discovered is exactly what we've been predicting. There's no other explanation for these microwaves. And completely by chance, they'd made the greatest discovery possibly in, in the history of astronomy. Mm. And there was a chap called Sir Herman Bondy, who had always been very sceptical about the Big Bang. And he said, look, if you want me to believe in the Big Bang theory, show me a fossil. And this was exactly the kind of fossil that he was talking about. So for that reason, I, I think we should put the Horn Antenna Telescope into the museum. So everything's expanding. So it should be possible to work out where in the universe the Big Bang came from. We live in a very precious time because after thousands of years of speculating about the origin of the universe, we're the first people to have 
a coherent model of the universe. Everything in the east is heading east, everything in the west is heading west. If you run the clock backwards, everything comes back towards us. And so everybody gets this impression that they're at the centre of the universe. So everywhere and nowhere really is at the centre of the universe. Um, I was going to ask another difficult question. Martin Rees, the Astronomer Royal, once said that we don't know where about 95% of the universe is. 95% of it's made of a combination of dark matter and dark energy. And it's rather embarrassing that 94, 96% of the universe is actually missing. But, but I think it's a great triumph that we know it's between 94 and 96%. I think that's, <laughs> that's what often doesn't get, get um, highlighted enough. It, the idea of dark matter was developed by a maverick called Fritz Vicky, a German astronomer working in America in the 1940s. And he developed this idea that there's stuff out there, we know it's out there because we can see its influence on mm. other stuff, but we just can't see it. And he's to be admired for that. The reason I love Fritz Vicky is that uh, he invented a wonderful insult for people he didn't like. If he didn't like somebody, he called them a spherical bastard. A <laughs> spherical bastard. By this he meant a sphere is a geometrical object which looks the same whichever way you look at it. And a spherical bastard is someone who's a bastard whichever way you look at them. Um, <laughs> I think, you don't I, think the Big Bang might be wrong? Nobody you think absolutely... I think, I think something extraordinary happened 13.7 billion years ago whereby hot, dense, compact universe expanded into the universe we have today. And we can, we can pretty much plot every stage of evolution of the universe from that moment of creation. What happened before that is a mystery, and that's what people still work on today. But there was, isn't the idea that there wasn't a before? Well, one idea is that not just space, but time was also created in the Big Bang. People often ask me, you know, what came before the Big Bang? And, and I explained to them what St. Augustine once said when he was asked sort of the parallel theological question. What was God doing before he created the universe? And St. Augustine replied he was creating hell for people to ask questions like that. <laughs> That's very good. All right, well, we accept that the amazing telescope that mm. by which they realised that the Big Bang happened, and we just need to know where to put it, Sean. Where do you, where do well, you think? Well, I think we should hide it, because I think they'll be pretty livid that we've got their telescope. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, put Perhaps. it in the telescope room section. <laughs> <laughs> now, are those other telescopes? Good you've idea. Got? We'll and have the spy that in the telescope room. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, so, Tim, what, pray, have you brought us? <laughs> well, what I'd like to put in the museum is Don Quixote, an incredible book, and I, I commend it to anyone who hasn't read it. It's written in two parts. The first part was written in 1604, when, of course, Shakespeare's writing Hamlet, and it was written in Spain by a man called Cervantes. In the first part of Don Quixote, it starts with the most beautiful line, somewhere in La Mancha, in a place that I don't care to remember, there's a man. It's a lovely way of starting a book. But this old man thinks, you know what, I've read all these books about knights running after maidens and slaying dragons and doing all this heroic stuff. Where was that in my life? And so he decides to leave his home and go out and become a knight errant and charges off out. He arrives at the local pub and goes, hello, I'm a knight errant. You must be the king of this particular area of the world. Please knight me that I can go off and do these wonderful deeds. The pub landlord thinking, here's a bit of a one. Knights Don Quixote as an evening's entertainment. But then, of course, he falls out with people in the I bar. I don't want to be rude, right? But you're not going to do the whole book, are you? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, on page two... <laughs> He then goes off on various adventures, of course of which the most famous is he charges at windmills and yeah. thinking they're giants, he crashes into them, he falls off, it's hilarious. And then of course the second part came along and the second part is just mind-blowing. When you think it was written in 1614, in the second part of Don Quixote, everyone in the book has read the first part of Don Quixote. Now, that's postmodernism. Mm. 350 years before postmodernism was invented. So when Don Quixote appears on the scene, they go, Oh, you're Don Quixote. Oh, yeah, we read the book. Oh, you're a crazy guy. And then... <laughs> The so thing, he's like a celebrity. In he's like job. a celebrity in his own book. Yeah. What you then realise is that in between parts one and two, somebody, not Cervantes, wrote a fake part two. 
Now, in part two of Don Quixote, Don Quixote meets the fake Don Quixote <laughs> from the fake part two, who he then gets to sign a legal document right. swearing that the entire fake part two of the book, which wasn't written by Cervantes, was fake and shouldn't be read by anyone. Because Don Quixote, the real Don Quixote, says, well, this man is a buffoon in the fake second book. I, on the other hand, am a genius. <laughs> and it's entirely brilliant conceit. And this is, of course, added to the fact that Cervantes writes the entire novel as though it was written by a Moor, uh, a North African. So again, Cervantes is saying, well, it's not my book. I just found a load of manuscripts in the desert. You know, this is what they said. So it's an entirely brilliant conceit that nearly every piece of literature after it has owed something to in the first place. It is the first modern novel. Did Don uh, Quixote inspire you directly? Did you... But you so, actually lived at him in Spain? I did, yeah, yeah. I, I, I got to Spain. I, uh, I, my, my plan at this stage was, I'll steal the Holy Grail. That's, <laughs> that's what knights do. So I packed my armour, went to Spain, and I arrived at Valencia Cathedral, and I, I was coming up to steal the Holy Grail in a suit of armour, and... This is all true. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's a just, sickness. I'm just worried what happened when you read Little Dorrit. <laughs> <laughs> The thing was that coming towards me was uh, the Holy Grail, but with the Cardinal of Valencia, five bishops, four truckloads of flowers, and, you know, <laughs> 30,000 people venerating this thing. And I thought, I'm never going to get away with nicking it now. I and I then ran to the inn where Don Quixote got knighted in the book, because it's still there. Yeah. And the landlord of the inn, without any words being spoken, it was almost like a magical moment, just picked up a big, like, stirring thing that they stir the wine with and knighted me in the courtyard of the inn. And then he called out into the evening dusk, Dulcinea, Dulcinea. Now that's Don Quixote's girlfriend in the book. And I turned around and the toothless woman <laughs> sitting on the bench looked across and went, hola. <laughs> I bet your wife dreads it when you pick up a book. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh no. I station zebra. Oh. <laughs> Well, we absolutely happily accept Don Quixote. Yes. Fantastic oh, uh, story, Tim. And on, on security at the front door of the museum, defending all that's noble. Thank you very much, Tim. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so, we've got an unusual shape in the sky, a crazy Spaniard, and a memorable telescope. Thank you very much, everybody. That's all from the Museum of Curiosity. <laughs> The Museum of Curiosity was created by John Lloyd and Sean Locke, with research by QI's James Harkin and Molly Oldfield. The exhibits were kindly donated by Tim Fitzhigham, Simon Singh and Gavin Pritapini. And the producers were Richard Turner and Dan Schreiber. If you're the curious sort and you'd like to snoop around the museum's exhibits and prod them, please make your way to the Radio 4 website, where you can find out more about the Museum of Curiosity. <laughs>